Now for the big picture. Uh, so we're going to begin with two uh, comments. Uh, one uh, by, uh, they're both by people who have uh, written extraordinarily important work on the history of business organizational forms and the, uh, and the corporation. We will begin with, um, with uh, Giuseppe Dari Mattiacci, who comes to us from the University of Netherlands. So I guess, you, are you in Col at Columbia this year? Or? I'm in Amsterdam. Oh, in Amsterdam, okay. And so you're up late as well. <laughs> Not so and late. Then, and then um, he, after, he will speak for about 10 minutes and then he will be followed by, um, by Tim Ganan of Yale University. Uh, and then we will open the floor to general discussion. So get in the queue in the usual ways by either messaging me or, or raising your hand. And let's have a vigorous discussion that where we figure out what this all means. All right, uh, Giuseppe. Yeah, so thank you. I have uh, two uh, things to say, only the first one of which is uncontroversial. Uh, this is a great conference. And the order in which uh, Tim and I are going is uh, the optimal way to ensure that there will be a climax rather than an anti-climax. <laughs> um, so, and the second, I will uh, try to present a conceptual framework. Uh, everybody who knows me knows that I'm an armchair historian who tells other people to dig deeper. Um, uh, so, and, and then I will connect with, with historical data and interpret some seemingly unrelated facts. And as you, as you will see, I will start with the, something that is very similar to the very first comment with which we started this uh, day and, and end with something that is very similar to the very last answer, uh, you know, given on the last paper. Um, so uh, here is the conceptual framework. Uh, change is key. And in the papers that um, uh, we have uh, seen today, uh, you know, we, we see periods of political change, of technological change, novel international connections or opportunities for trade, legal transplants or newly available sources of capital. So I'm thinking about change really <clears throat> broadly. And, and, and change, of course, involves uncertainty because whenever you know, a new situation arises, uh, firms might not know uh, what the future um, will bring. Uh, for example, the new, uh, new technology may, may fail or you know, the political uh, wind might change and so forth. So I will, I will think about a main trade-off and that involves how organizations respond to uh, change. So exposed, broadly speaking, when, when that is when uncertainty is resolved. Uh, so whether you know when some when when it's known whether the technology works or not, for example, um, the, the choice is between continuation, like technology works, so we need to stay on course, we need to keep trying, we need to stay afloat, or liquidation, technology doesn't work, we need to change course, sell assets, and avoid for the losses. And this will apply also, you know, to other types of change uh, that I've uh, mentioned. But ex ante, organizations might anticipate the need to you know, liquidate or continue, and they might adopt a structure that, for example, facilitates continuation. This will shield the company from inefficient liquidation that might come from liquidity shocks of the partners, lack of understanding of the value of continuation, lack of expertise of the decision makers, and so forth. So some organizational choices will, will lock the continuation outcome, uh, you know, this, the same choices will expose the firm to inefficient continuation. So if it's difficult to liquidate, you know, we might observe entrenchment exposed. Uh, so businesses that don't change course very rapidly, the assets that are sold too late, uh, expropriation by entrenched managers, minority uh, control groups, elites, or despotic governments, and so forth. So in a sense, you know, I want to frame uh, uh, everything we have seen today as a matter of easy continuation versus easy uh, liquidation. So, you know, we have talked about corporate versus partnerships form. Uh, we can think about the corporate form as, a, as an organizational choice that facilitates continuation. And we might think about the partnership as an organizational form that facilitates liquidation. But we can do the same, you know, when we think about voting power it can be concentrated, therefore facilitating entrenchment and or dispersed, maybe, you know, bringing more voices and, and uh, making it easier to change course. Uh, and the same with investor protection, whether strong versus 
uh, a weak, sorry, versus strong investors production along the same lines of continuation versus liquidation and, and similarly with, with ownership. So the, the, this raises a question, and that is to what extent the findings uh, of the various papers can be explained by ex-ante choices uh, rather than looking at ex-post outcomes. Uh, ex-ante choices um, concerning the um, governance or ownership structure that um, is adopted ex-ante, which could be the optimally or, or, or strategically best way to balance continuation and liquidation ex ante, right? Um, so for instance, if, if, if a particular type of business requires easy continuation, it might be optimal ex ante to choose the corporate form, but this may lead exposed to disastrous failures rather than orderly liquidations that might, be, might have been facilitated by partnership form. So I, you know, I'm, I'm playing with the with something that has come out a lot during the discussion, that is the endogeneity of organizational choices, the various organizational choices that we have seen, and, and therefore um, uh, the difficulty of, of uh, assigning uh, causes, identifying causes in these cases. So we have seen, you know, the, in the US, the, the organizational choices made by railroads versus other companies. Uh, higher, fa higher failure rates in Egypt for particular type of business incorporated under particular laws, uh, no difference in performance in Britain, uh, different body structure in, in Russia. So I'm suggesting that this, you know, these different findings could be interpreted through this uh, lens. Um, and, 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 and the implication is, is, of course, that you know, differences or lack, lack of differences in ex post outcomes. Uh, for example, failure rates, profitability, risk of expropriation may be the result of efficient ex ante governance and ownership choices, uh, which might introduce uh, you know, a complication so that it may be difficult to assess success or failure of a particular organizational choice, but only focusing on ex post outcomes. If the environment is such that uh, different companies were differently exposed to the uncertainties of change, so that you know, they had ex ante optimal or strategically optimal for the control group uh, choices of, uh, of structure. So in my own work, for example, I, you know, I saw that at the early stage of the East India Company and the Dutch East India Company, uh, although the Dutch East India Company had a much uh, um, more clearly locked in capital, uh, you know, there was also weaker uh, investor protection as to uh, you know, the type of um, insight that investors could, could get on, on the way business was run. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and there also, uh, you know, the, our point was that this was the optimal ex ante uh, answer to different environments, uh, which brought about different uh, sort of risks for the, for the two companies. So I'm suggesting that, you know, this could be uh, what's going on in many of the cases that we have analyzed uh, today. So I, I leave it here, and I, I think I you know, didn't use up my 10 minutes. I'll, I'll give the floor to, uh, to Tim. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, <clears throat> I do not have slides. I had slides, but uh, I've had to rewrite things on the fly because so much of what I was going to say has already come up. So I'm not going to bore you with slides. I think for many of us, we're sick of slides at this point. So uh, maybe that's a, a welcome thing. Um, I was really struck when I read Maddie's paper, and I'm going to emphasize the, the core ideas in that paper. I hope I'm not sliding anybody else. I think what I'm trying to say is that some of what she's talking about is, is, is relevant to other papers as well. Her paper, I take it, is largely about legal transplantation, now, how hard that is to do and how hard it is to understand. And I think she does the how hard to understand thing very well. I was just really struck reading her text, how, how hard it was for everybody on the ground there to figure out um, you know, what is British law in Chinese terms? What exactly is Chinese law, et cetera? I'm going to come back to that. And then I started thinking about something that comes out of my own work, which is I think of the corporation is really a product, the business corporation, is largely a product of legal transplantation, whether we appreciate it or not. The reason is it's a relatively new animal. We have 200 years really of business corporations, general incorporations in most places, is not even 200 years old. In the places I'm familiar with, most of the discussion about the early charters as well as codification drew heavily on discussions of other places. 
Now, these discussions took various forms. Often they were insincere. My suspicion, for example, by the way, is that Alfred Marshall is not sincere in his alleged admire, admiration of the US. Um, so you see a lot of that kind of thing where they say, we don't want to do it this way. That's the way the British do it. That's a disaster. Other cases, of course, if they want something and they can pin it on the British, they can say, well, Britain's a very successful country. So if we do it, their corporation will be in good shape. But this is always in the discussion. And whether it's sincere or not, that there's a lot of um, it, it, thinking of the, of the corporation, either what we're going to do or what we're not going to do is either a, a process of legal transplantation or a, a rejection of legal transplantation. Um, I think this is actually lurking in several of the papers here. Let me just point that, uh, point that out. Uh, I'm not talking about an explicitly comparative approach. I'm just thinking that sometimes when, when we're thinking about the problem we're facing, it might be, be useful to think about the intellectual uh, underpinnings of the, of, the, of the institution we're, we're actually uh, looking at. Um, for example, in Amanda's paper, um, this is, by the way, you may not know that Amanda and Steve are both my students. And like all good students, they, they routinely ignored everything I said. That's a, that's a mark of a good student. Um, one of the things I really pressed them over and over to do was to understand if this distinction between these two corporations is actually the same distinction you see in both French and German law. My guess is not a lot of I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, but as they say, they can't really track down the identity so much of these shareholders and their nationality. And someone already said it's a great idea. Was this was the choice of one of these two kinds of corporations in part an effort to reassure a particular kind of external investor? Now, I think as Will suggested, looking at what's listed on stock markets in different countries, that's a fantastic idea if you can do that. I just wonder if you can look at some corporations and see that, well, what they're trying to do is make this Russian thing look French so that uh, it will reassure French investors who are used to particular kinds of rules. And you can say the same thing about the German as well. Jihan's case, um, I've always enjoyed his work on the Ottoman Empire because when you think you've encountered the, the nuttiest legal things possible, then you learn one more thing about the Ottoman Empire. Um, this is the case where uh, the legal transplantation is, is basically, you can use any law you want here until they get sick of the whole process and they forbid it. Um, part of me wonders too, if there's something to learn from looking at these different charters uh, for the different kinds of uh, corporations formed to operate in, in Egypt, although they're actually formed under somebody else's law, and there's some some of the similar process where if these British corporations, British corporations formed under British law, have some features which are unusual for an actual British corporation that doesn't reflect part of the, the influence of, of um, the fact that it's in this mixed environment. Let me just go back to, to Maddie's paper, which again, I, I without slighting anybody else, I just found myself uh, fascinated. Here we have Chinese law. So we have a process of the Chinese trying to figure out what their law is. That's a theme in this discussion. Uh, part of the problem is that law isn't the same across China. So she mentions the example of the Shanghai court saying something, nobody else says, well, that's just Shanghai. And then you have these other institutions in China, like these guilds, which don't really have legal authority, but they have something approaching legal authority. So it, it's hard to actually figure out what actual Chinese law is. The British come in in a way which has made them beloved to many people across the empire, explain that we don't really care what you do, but we know it's inferior to us. But would you please explain what you do so we can understand how it's inferior to us? And that's part of the theme going on here. Maddie mentioned something that she might want to push a little bit harder. When the Japanese start operating in China, they're operating under a different civil law. So they're operating under, as she says, it's essentially German civil law, and that's probably uh, mostly right. So, these are processes of trying to understand what we do, trying to understand how it compares to what somebody else does, what are we doing in somebody else's terms and so forth. Um, and that is why this transplantation is so hard, because the people who think they're doing it, I think are sometimes either sincerely or insincerely getting things wrong. Um, and sometimes it actually leads to very practical uh, misunderstandings, either for us or for them. So as someone's already said, that's why I have no sides. Um, some of these really familiar animals turn out to be unfamiliar, or perhaps they're like somebody else's animal. So someone earlier, I think it was Mel Pargandler, pointed out that the Chinese partnerships have some corporate features. Well, they sound like corporate features because we think of Anglo-Saxon partnerships. Actually, the features they had are typical of the registration systems on the continent. So French and German partnerships had some of these, these what we were identifying earlier as corporate uh, features. Um, more generally, what the English are probably thinking, uh, hearing some of these Chinese practices and why that's bizarre and bizarre. And it may just reflect the fact that they don't 
don't know as much about continental law as they might. And again, they might even would understand section. So, uh, weird, it's just different from, from the Anglo Saxon law. Um, anyway, that's what I had to say. I hope that's big enough thought for, for you guys. Um, it's, it's about a big thought I can get uh, from you. I want to congratulate the uh, organizers for um, assembling this great group of papers. I also want to tease Henry. I noticed something interesting about all the authors. Not a single one is a lawyer. And, and I wonder what, how that's correlated with the quality of the papers. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, right now, we don't have anyone uh, jumping into the queue. So probably the best way to proceed is to let the people who uh, gave, while people are thinking of things they want to ask or comments they want to make, let the uh, people who gave papers today uh, reflect on uh, uh, Tim and Giuseppe's comments. Um, we could go in the order, but that would put Amanda on the spot. Do you want to go first, Amanda? Sure, I can, I can say a few comments Mostly what I'm going to say is that the both comments were really intriguing and I think we need to do more thinking, but as you know, especially where to start. So in Giuseppe's comment, that's a really interesting framework. I, you know, I would completely agree that when we're thinking about the ex post outcomes, you know, we're sort of asserting that it's a, that it depends on the ex ante choice. That's like vaguely what we're trying to say in the paper but of course there's a lot that happens in the middle and trying to conceptualize what are the relevant dimensions of what you call change that can act in a heterogeneous manner on the corporations for example by industry or capital intensity of these kinds of dimensions that could be really fruitful and so i think we want to go back and, and think about that a little bit more um, in response to, to Tim, I'll say that Tim, of we've never ignored you. It's just taken me ten years to, to understand your point. So it's just <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, it just takes me a little to get there. <laughs> um, and, and so, and 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 really being honest, I think it's taken us this long to really understand what the corporations were trying to accomplish in the way that they were designed because the templates that they are adopting they did not create from scratch there were models and so in choosing to adopt those models what are the objectives that they're trying to achieve and 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 that's where we're at right now and so maybe uh, in 10 more years i'll realize that you told us the answer to more things so stay tuned uh, Maddie, I'll jump in. Okay. I'm sorry, I'll jump in. I, I, had, I had difficulty understand. I, I didn't have difficulty understanding Tim because he said things that were not understandable. It's just that it, it came through a bit um, muffled. So I, I, I missed the joke that everybody was laughing about at the end, and I'm sorry about that. But but in no any wires on the right. program. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I, I, first of all, I have to say, I really appreciate um, being amongst a group that, that actually are consider the Chinese case to be important in a, in a larger framing of what happens to the, the corporation. Um, I think that shows a, a bit of a change in the field. Um, Tim's comment, though, about um, you know the 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 sense that people have that Chinese partnership had corporate features, and therefore Chinese people did not necessarily feel the need to um, to uh, undertake incorporation. Uh, it, it, it's it's very odd because, of course, as we as we see the. the the, the main business actors that Chinese people are having contact with, and of course, this is largely a coastal community that are having contact with, with foreign business people, are British. And so they're, they're reacting to the discontents of British partners in various kinds of business transactions that want to see 
you know, they want to know that their partners are acting in the same way, that, that the expectations are that they will be following the same rules of the game that they are. When China finally does adopt a model for its own legal system, it goes to continental models. And there's a lot of discussion about why this is the case, but I think it's very clear that the main reason is that that Chinese traditional law was a statute law. And the German system was just much more understandable to them. Uh, but this keeps that, that kind of discontinuity between British practice and, and, and continental practice out there uh, in the air and, and further complicates things when people are trying to do, to do business. I also just wanted to say, um, I appreciated the comment about transplantation being hard to do. People have very different motivations for wanting to adopt different models. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the different, the different places where these, this process is, is taking place, it's very clear that in some of those instances, the motivations do not have a lot to do with their feeling that a particular legal system is better. There's a lot of politics involved and, and associating with different um, different, you know, trade opportunities and so on and so forth. So, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's all I'm going to say right now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, so we're starting to get cues. So maybe rather than uh, go directly to the other presenters, we'll intersperse with, uh, with people on the queue. So my queue is Bill English, Henry Hansman, John Wallace, and Will Getzman. Go ahead, Naomi. I actually had a reaction, I think, to Giuseppe's uh, comments, which, which are really interesting to me, in part because his his mind was going in a very different direction than mine. Uh, so I thought maybe I I just explore that difference. Um, if I understood your argument, Giuseppe, the the thought was that may, maybe the kind of ex ante organizational decisions that were being made were being made optimally to deal with uncertainty. And, and then the outcomes couldn't really be read as the result of the decisions that were made. The decisions that were made were optimal decisions given the uncertainty that was faced. And, uh, and so the natural thing for an economist to try to do is kind of link the outcomes to the decision. And, and maybe that's just not, not gonna work out. Um, I, I think the, the reason why I say that, I was thinking about things in a very different direction was I was thinking that the the uh, kind of the, the implicit modeling of the ex ante decision is really complicated because there are so many incentive problems. Uh, there there are so many different actors. There are so many trade offs that are being negotiated. That that I think before you can say the ex ante organizational decisions were optimal, you have to say optimal for who. Uh, you know, what, what, who, who's making the decision and, and in what sense optimal. And, and maybe that came out the most clearly to me in, uh, in the paper about Russia, um, because uh, there it was explicit that there's a negotiation going on uh, between, between the, the government officials and the people who want to set up a corporation. The corporation writes down a set of rules, presumably rules they like. They send them to the government. The government doesn't like them for some reason. They, they make changes, they send them back. So there's a negotiation. And I think in a lot of these cases, there are negotiations going on. And, and it may be helpful to try to understand what is that negotiation? What, what are the really key trade-offs that are being negotiated? And that's gonna lead you to the way that decision is being made. And, uh, and that may or may not have the implication that you were raising that that there may not be a close link between uh, the organizational structure and the outcomes. I'm just going to actually let Steve uh, in here because he wanted to also to respond to Giuseppe's uh, comment and uh, so it would follow right on Bill English's point. Yeah, actually, Bill, the, that leads in really well. Um, my point was something that we, we mentioned that we were going to do uh, related to something we mentioned we were going to do and still our work doing. And that's to think about how these, these ex ante contracts get recontracted, how they get amended, how they get revised in various ways. And I think 
there's sort of a lack, at least maybe I, I'm not very much of an expert in this field at all, but really a lack of, of thinking about how the, the individual laws that are applying to a particular corporation are being amended over time in response to the very shocks and changes in uncertainty and changes overall that Giuseppe mentioned. So I think that's another, that's a dimension that all of our papers, or at least my paper, and maybe Chahan's as well, is sort of taking a static snapshot at the beginning of, of the corporations and sort of playing with that, as opposed to thinking about how those static entities would be changing over time in the law, not necessarily as well as in their finances and in their economic performance and so on and so forth, so let's mention. Great, thank you. So let's return to the queue and then we'll go to other presenters as, as it uh, makes sense, Henry. Yes, I think um, I, I, one of the great virtues of the five papers that we've had today are that they focus on what, what, what we've just been speaking about here, which is the, um, the, the inherent logic of the um, corporate form, I'll put it that way. Um, we, have, we have five different jurisdictions covered by these five papers that are really quite different. Um, in their politics, in their economic development, in their social development, in their social customs and mores, the institutions that have grown up in the society, the organizations they've lived with. And we find all five of these societies converging on a, on a single form pretty fast. Um, within 50 years, it's all done um, between 1850, say, and 1950. And um, I think that raises two questions. Um, one is, is the corporate form in fact um, uh, a, a single form? That is, do you have any choices or don't you have any choices? Um, the logic of the form is so strong, um, it, um, driven by the marketability of shares, that um, it's possible that you really don't have much choice, that um, um, to make shares transferable, they have to, uh, you have to limit the, their exposure to debt. Um, you have to uh, homogenize exposure to debt. Um, you have to homogenize um, participation in earnings. Um, and, um, and it's, logi it's logical to have a, a voting framework that is um, uh, compatible with this um, in which all members vote. So, um, so maybe the reason all these different societies um, converged on the corporate form um, is uh, that they didn't have any choice to do it. They, they could use all the imagination they wanted, but they were gonna screw it up if they, if they tried to change it very much from the basic models originally developed in the 19th century. Um, that raises the question of what, um, what influence law and society has on it. Um, and here I think um, uh, uh, Will Getzman um, uh, um, raises the right issue. Um, raises the right example, I think. Um, the Bazak Mills um, um, adopted a corporate form stunningly similar to the pure corporate form that we have today in, in the Western world, or the Western and the Eastern world, um, throughout the world. And it seemed to get there, not with a statute. Um, it was a kind of common law system, apparently, um, in which uh, the law was made up as they went along presumably by judges, um, and um, the, the mills um, um, did not have the kind of monopoly power that, uh, that made them uh, easier to form than um, later on railroads and shipping companies and so forth would be. Um, and um, they were in a competitive industry, more or less. Uh, they had some market power by, their, um, by virtue of their occupancy of a particular place on the, on the river. But, um, but arguably it was a situation where the law was fa fairly non-interventionist. Um, the market forces happened to be just right and, and just the right magnitude to uh, mm -hmm. make a, one or a couple of, uh, of uh, corporations the efficient ownership model for, a, um, for the firms. And, um, and we, we got what we, what you get in that sort of environment. Uh, 400 years before we get it in other environments. Um, and uh, by, by the end of the 14th century, they had already formed uh, um, the Bazak Mills as um, uh, share corporations. 
And um, so I think something it's worth looking for examples like that, um, where that may be the only example we have where the corporation uh, um, grows up and uh, flowers without any obvious transplant. They weren't copying anybody. There was nobody to copy. And, um, and yet it, it seems if, 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 a, if my description of it is correct, um, it reinforces this notion that um, the corporate form has one interior logic and um, the, the, the joint stock company with tradable shares has one, one inherent logic to it. And, um, and um, so any environment you look at is gonna, gonna push in that direction. Um, any large economy is gonna drive in that, be driven in that direction. So that we can look hard at all of these variables we've been looking at today, um, but um, they aren't controlling. Um, the logic of the form is controlling and it will win out in the end. Anyway, I offer this just as a thought. And, um, um, and, um, and it's because we have such, a, such a, um, solipsistic notions as this that we, um, we lawyers don't publish much about these things. Um, we might make fools of ourselves. So, uh, so uh, the cue is John Wallace, uh, Will Getzman, and Oren Sussman. And, uh, but presenters who want to jump in on a particular point should really do uh, cut the, the line. So, um, so John. Yeah. Um... I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend the morning sessions. I had a previously planned doctor's appointment. Um, I, when, when, particularly when Tim was talking about transplanting, I've been working a lot on sort of 19th century European politics. Uh, and Naomi and I have been working on societies that have impersonal rules, rules that apply equally to everyone. And in 1800, there's no society in Europe uh, that has rules that apply equally to everyone. Um, including corporations. Uh, the majority of corporations are special. They're all a little bit different from one another. Um, and, the, and in the middle of the 19th century, that begins to change. It changes in the United States at the state level. It changes in Britain at the parliamentary level. And it creates a very different environment for Henry's corporations, which is there's a set of rules out there that are external to the corporation, which the corporation can access. And in fact, their ability to access those rules is signified by this piece of paper, the charter, <laughs> that enables them to do that. Um, and in many cases, that's not um, countries, even in Europe in the 19th century, that's not the case. There are, as someone said about, um, as Steve said about Russia, there's these negotiations over what the piece of paper is and what the piece of paper means. And it seems to me, that those dynamics are extremely important to acknowledge. That if we're talking about a society which has managed uh, to set up a set of rules for corporations and how they behave, that's very different than a society in which the rules for any specific corporation differ uh, from organization to organization. Um, and I've, I've used less as 1910 census of countries, of corporations in, in different countries to identify what I think of as uh, open access societies that have rules that allow anyone to form an organization who wants to. And I take them as the top 10 or 12 countries on his list, which are by orders of magnitude have more corporations um, than the countries down below. Germany and France turn out to be kind of the dividing point there. Um, but that, that these questions about transplanting are gonna be really important if you're moving from, a, you're trying to transplant a model where the rules apply equally to everybody into a society in which none of the rules apply equally to everybody. Well, yeah, well, uh, I think uh, some of what I was going to uh, um, focus on, I think, um, has been already said, but I wanted to first um, congratulate you for putting together a conference that really focuses on this international dimension, uh, because I think that, um, you know, the, throughout the day, uh, it's being able to uh, investigate um, the corporation um, and its development uh, um, as it kind of clashes with um, the various kinds of cultures and norms is a great way to learn about uh, what worked, what didn't, how things, you know, evolved. But, um, you know, I thought for me, 
the focus on the papers on Russia and Egypt and China were wonderful because all of those countries, um, you know, had to deal to one degree or the other with this notion of uh, imperialism. That um, it was a matter of um, I don't know um, uh, how much should we adapt to this? Um, can we take these um, models of uh, of, uh, of investors who we don't know um, and adapt them to um, a society where our notions of fairness, for example, in China, um, you know, of what's right and fair and just might be very different than what is what the same thing might be in Britain. So, um, so that was really enlightening and, and, and to see new research being um, done and tests uh, um, of, of ideas about of how that happened in these various countries, I just thought was really exciting. Um, you know, the broader theme about um, about equity is kind of uh, another thing that we've been kind of imagining because um, these corporations can always be thought of as some kind of exploitative uh, institution within society and, and so forth. But um, the thing that um, comes out of all the papers is uh, the notion that, um, you know, to get investors to commit their money uh, in return for a piece of paper that says they'll get something in the future um, requires um, not just a robust set of rules that you could borrow, but a set of rules that you then have to adapt every time somebody figures out how to uh, cheat, deceive, you know, tunnel, and, 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 and so forth. So, um, Anyway, uh, it was a great opportunity for me to, to think about all of these things. And, and uh, you know, I just want to congratulate the presenters uh, on, on wonderful work. And, and, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, Oren, uh, assessment, and then um, Eric wants to jump in. I, I wanted to echo uh, the point made by uh, Bill English in, in a slightly different uh, uh, way. I, I, I think that I, I was surprised by the extent that a, a group of historians are, are, some of them at least, uh, historically minded uh, lawyers, are excited by the conceptual framework of, of corporate finance, namely three periods, uh, ex ante, interim, ex post, contracting, uh, executing, etc., where at least three of, of the countries that were uh, studied are what we call today transition economies, and they are still transition economies, Russia, China, and Egypt. If I'm thinking about Egypt, this is, this is a country where, where a family of soldiers is trying to take control from a, a crumbling empire with the help of a, a, an external power, England. So it's the Muhammad Ali dynasty taking over from the, the Osman and the Brits are helping. And in addition, this is a, 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 a country which is pioneering a process of secularization, which is not over yet in the Arab world. In a, in a setting like that, you write a piece, you write something on a piece of paper, you have no idea how uh, 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 an English judge will, will look at it, how your trading partner who doesn't know English will, will think about it, who do you have to pay in order to get uh, enforcement. This background, I don't know enough about doing business in, in Egypt during that time, but I just find it hard to believe that it didn't have a stronger effect on the way people did business than uh, the way that it was, the way that it can be captured by the boring ex ante interim ex post optimal contracting that uh, corporate, corporate uh, finance people like me like to put in their papers. Eric? Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly respond to uh, something Giuseppe said and something Tim said. Um, just, I found both uh, discussions commentary very stimulating. And um, anyway, I just thought I'd offer my perspective. So, so one of the 
observations Giuseppe made or the conceptualizations was to, to ask whether we should think of like corporations with different ownership structures as representing you know the outcome of an ex ante choice or not. And an interesting thing about um, the United States in, in the period that I'm studying is that um, irrespective of the benefits from the standpoint of like the functioning or the governance of a corporation, um, there was another really important consideration when it comes to the distribution of ownership, which was explicitly political. So there's a lot of enthusiasm, especially around 1910, 1920 for some kind of like ownership society conception of capitalism. And, and there was a belief in the business world that it would be advantageous to have, you know, ordinary households owning them, their employees, their customers owning shares, just mass ownership um, for many different reasons. Um, and one of which was, you know, it held the potential to insulate them from a lot of scrutiny and punitive reg regulations from the state. So it was believed to be advantageous to be, you know, this integral part of society rather than this like elite of, of robber barons or whatever, who are the owners of these enterprises, which would presumably make them more attractive targets. So it, when, when you're thinking about ownership structures, there's this interesting political dimension to them that really comes out um, in, in that period in the United States. Um, and then with regard to Tim's comment, I mean, his, his uh, mention of transplantation and its difficulties and all the ambiguities and uh, complexities of of interpretation and so on. It resonates with me in thinking about the United States as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, people ascribe this enormous significance to the legacy of the common law implantation in the United States is of course another transplant country. But when, when you look at the, the world of business and law, you know, by the turn of the 20th century, you know, it's it's the product of all this local adaptation and 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 it starts to become this much, even though it's a transplant system, it becomes very much this indigenous system of law. And there's all this incredible innovation that happens in response to changing conditions and in response to political pressures um, and so on. And so the fact that we're seeing it, you know, hundred and some years after the common law, or much longer than that actually. So, so long after the common law was introduced in the United States means it's, it's you sort of, you start to see, you appreciate the significance of all the innovation and adaptation that happens in the wake of that. So we uh, only have about um, seven minutes left, but, uh, and Maddie wants to jump in, but um, before I turn the floor over to Maddie, I wanna do two things. Um, one is to point that there's a, a question from Mary Yeager, um, pushing you harder on the issues of gender and persistent inequalities that the panel might want to address. And I also uh, want to mention that I have a, an email, not, it's not in the chat or in the Q&A from Mira Wilkins, who, uh, had a, who was inspired by the papers this morning to ask a question about the role of lawyers in setting up uh, corporate forums used in Russia, Egypt, and China. And she is, um, is curious about the training of these people, um, whether they traveled abroad, what, to how it is that they are mediating uh, these forums, what their language skills are, what their biographies are. And uh, so I put those on the table, turn the floor over to Maddie, and we'll, we don't have much time left, but uh, yeah. Just, just very, very quickly, I was just struck by what Eric was talking about with regard to the ownership society, because many of the people who are talking about the importance of the corporation in China are looking at the United States and they have this illusion that every person in the United States owns, share, owns shares in companies. This is the way to go to become a powerful place. So that I thought that was quite interesting. And the other thing is, the legal profession is very underdeveloped in, in China, um, really down to the 1920s and 30s, uh, when you begin to see training a whole generation of people that in a profession that really didn't exist before the end of the dynasty. Yeah. Uh Thanks. 
so I want to start with this uh, comment about the lawyers. They actually are were quite important in you know drafting these charters. Like their names are actually coming up. I I, I actually collected their names. Like some of these people like appear over and over and again. Whether it's a British charter or uh, a French charter. Uh, these people, you know, like if you think about, and I, I think this is similar to Maddie's uh, setting as well, like these mixed courts have European judges, like British judges, Greek judges, French judges, but also, you know, Egyptian judges, they are trained in schools, uh, modeled after these, you know, more like European law schools at the time. And, uh, you know, if you, if I, when I read some of these like uh, legal scholarship, like they're sort of gushing about like how, how like really beautiful the system is. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure like that, that itself is biased in some other ways uh, because it looks like a system good for lawyers. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, they, 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 they were quite influential in sort of uh, navigating this new legal system. Um, and when the, this is important for understanding the transplantation process as well, which is really at the heart of this, uh, I find, uh, because like they're adopting this law and uh, it is, I mean, I wouldn't say totally alien in the sense that, you know, things like limited liability, things like that, they, they existed, right? I mean, so it's really this like legal personhood and uh, like that, that idea is sort of new uh, that they have to deal with. Um, and, uh, that also like ties into in some, like some of the things that uh, Oren also pointed out is the role of the state in this, which is like they are also navigating like they're transplanting this law and they are navigating different political forces, right? I mean, in this way, it's a country, for example, occupied by the British, but they also wanted to become independent from the Ottoman Empire. So there is all that tension going on uh, in in the background, and that's sort of affecting their like. They, they, they want European capital, right? They want foreign investments. And that's why they want to encourage like more people to set up corporations. At the same time, they get very anxious about, about bubbles bursting and this financial crisis and like promoters issuing like these different types of shares. And I, you know, this is, um, I think this is what makes the part of like studying this part of the world fascinating for me. Uh, but, you know, as I, I think Naomi has always pointed out before, like the, the reality is actually, you know, quite complicated and I, I, I like to complicate the, the paper. <laughs> Usually historians say that. <laughs> um, John, would you like to get in here? Yeah, thank you, Naomi. Apologies, I, I've come up because we're in the middle of a heat in, in, in our rooms uh, today, so it's 75 degrees and uh, taking advantage of it. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you to you and Henry for organizing this today. It's been a very, very enjoyable day and I've learned lots and uh, thank you so much for, for that. I really want to go back to this point of, of transplantation because I often think about it within the country and thinking about, you know, businesses are, are doing their thing, uh, they're designing their organizational form, they're adopting certain rules and they're observing one another and they're beginning to imitate one another. And so there's this whole evolutionary process that's, that's at play. And I haven't really begun to scratch the surface of how that's happening in, in the UK. Uh, never mind then thinking about how the UK is, is imitating uh, and transplanting things from, from, from other uh, countries. I was really taken by Tim's point that Marshall may have been insincere. Uh, he probably <laughs> was being insincere. Uh, but, but, you know, thank you once again for a very, very enjoyable day. Well, thanks to uh, all of you for uh, incredible uh, papers, incredible comments, uh, and great questions and uh, comments and responses. Uh, so we're just going to have a few wrap-up comments right now. Um, let me turn the floor over to Henry. Henry, are you there? I am here. OK. <laughs> All right, it didn't go away. Um, so uh, I think, uh, first of all, thanks must be given to a person you haven't seen on screen today, but who is behind all the screens. That's Elaine McPartland, uh, who basically runs GCGC and ECGI, are two of our three um, sponsors today. And um, she is just a, a model of patience uh, with academics and, um, and, um, and a, finding good solutions to, uh, to problems the rest of us uh, get overwhelmed by. She's worked very hard. Um, and so I would say a shout out to, uh, to Elaine McPartland for all she's done behind this, this show. 
and Elaine, show yourself. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I thank Naomi also for uh, this is uh, this is really her business, um, uh, not mine, and. Um, uh, her hand lies uh, extremely heavily on, on everything that was done here, as you all know. So uh, she has been just uh, terrific uh, intellectually and organizationally, and um, my heartfelt thanks goes out to to, um, to to you for um, all the work that you put into this. Uh, without Naomi, this would have been inconceivable, simply inconceivable. So, um, so I let it go with that. I, we will have a breakout chat uh, or breakout uh, socialization uh, room after this, I believe. Um, and um, maybe I'll see some of you there, I hope to. But thank you all for coming and for making it a great conference. <laughs>